So, plants versus zombies is pretty wild. You've got pea shooters, exploding cherries, sunflowers powering your defences. It's silly, it's fun, but it does get you thinking. Can plants actually defend themselves? Not in a battle the undead kind of way, but in nature plants really do have to contend with constant threats. From insects, fungi, even other plants. And while they might look calm and peaceful, there are some pretty serious strategies that they've evolved. Here in this video, I'm going to share a few of my favourite examples of real-world plant defence mechanisms. Ones that make you realise these living things are far from passive. They've been fighting for survival for millions of years, just a little more quietly than in Plants vs Zombies. One of the most important things to understand about plants is this. They can't run, they can't hide. Once a seed takes root, that's it. No escaping predators, no moving to safer ground. So evolution took a different route. Instead of mobility, plants invested in resilience. And you'd be surprised how physical some of these defences can get. Take thorns or spines, these are classic deterrents. They're not just for show. One brush with a rose bush or cactus is enough to make most animals think twice. Then there are trichomes, tiny hairs on the surface of leaves or stems. Some are soft and fuzzy, but others are sharp, hooked or even chemical tipped, acting like microscopic barbed wire. Some plants even embed their tissues with silica, essentially grains of glass that wear down the teeth of insects and grazers over time, so it's like eating sandpaper. Others build hard outer cuticles, waxy layers, or hard seed coats that physically block access to the good stuff inside. In a way, it's like wearing armour, not because plants are fragile, but because their enemies are so persistent. From the time they sprout, they're under attack, and these physical barriers are the first line of defence. If plants can't fight back physically, they turn to chemistry. And this is where it gets interesting, because plants aren't just passive greenery, they're living chemical labs. Consider the tobacco plant. It produces nicotine, not to give humans a buzz, but as a neurotoxin. It overwhelms the nervous system of insects, usually killing them. What feels like a mild stimulant to us is a death sentence to a caterpillar. Or look at coffee and tea plants. They didn't evolve caffeine to help us stay awake through deadlines. That bitter molecule exists to disrupt insect behaviour, affecting memory, locomotion, and even survival. And then there's the chilli pepper. Its characteristic burn comes from capsaicin, a chemical that targets pain receptors in mammals. But interestingly, birds don't feel it. Birds are excellent seed dispersers. They eat the seeds whole and carry the seeds far from the parent plant undamaged. So the chilli plant selectively deters mammals who are likely to crush or digest the seeds, but leaves the door open for the birds. So it's a targeted biological strategy. These chemicals aren't low cost either. Time, nutrients and energy are required to provide them. But this evolution happened because those plants with defences survived. So in Plants vs Zombies, the plants are on the front line, holding off the threat alone. But real plants aren't always solo fighters. In the real world, some of them call for help, and they've spent millions of years building these symbiotic relationships to do it. One of the clearest examples is the acacia tree. It has these swollen hollow thorns that look quite decorative, but inside live colonies of ants. The tree produces a sugary nectar just for them, not for pollination but for protection. And in return these ants act like full-time security guards. So if a browsing animal or even an insect starts feeding on the leaves, the ants swarm biting and stinging. So it's a co-evolution, sort of like if I feed you, you protect me. Other plants use more temporary reinforcements, so things like tobacco and corn. When they're being chewed by a caterpillar, the damage triggers a burst of airborne chemicals, which is subtle but complex. These scents attack parasitic wasps. These insects then find the caterpillar, lay their eggs inside and let the larvae develop by consuming it from within. So although that's pretty horrifying, from the plant's perspective it's a pretty clean solution. They call in a killer that takes out their attacker without wasting their own energy. These kind of alliances aren't that rare, they've evolved again and again across species and ecosystems. So the plants have stayed alive and survived by outsourcing their own defence. So up to this point we've mainly been discussing what a single plant can do on its own. But interestingly, individual plants don't just react to their direct threats, they can also warn each other. So, for example, when a caterpillar starts nibbling on a leaf, the damaged plant releases tiny airborne molecules, volatile organic compounds or VOCs. These molecules float around in the air and are picked up by neighbouring plants. 
and when these plants pick them up, they begin cranking up their own defences, thickening their cell walls, producing more toxins and changing their metabolism. Sort of warning each other heads up, something's munching on me, prepare yourself. These signals can be species specific, so not only are they warning of danger, but they can almost describe the threat. And the communication doesn't just stop above the ground. Beneath our feet, the roots of many plants are connected by vast networks of mycorrhizal fungi, microscopic threads that form symbiotic partnerships with roots. These fungi help plants absorb nutrients, but they also transmit signals, including chemical messages related to stress or injury. Using these underground fibres, plants can share information about drought, disease or insect attack. Although it's not consciousness, it is a sort of awareness, a distributed network transmitting survival information across a whole forest floor. Scientists call it the mycorrhizal network, or sometimes the wood wide web, because it behaves like an ecological internet. It's a reminder that plants don't live alone, they're connected, and sometimes they're looking out for each other. Even the sunflower from Plants vs Zombies, the one that happily churns out sunlight like a living solar panel, has a seed of truth to it. If you pardon the pun. <laughs> It's not producing currency for lawn defence strategy, but real sunflowers are surprisingly tactile about light. Especially when they're young, they track the sun across the sky, turning their faces from east to west over the course of a day. And this behaviour is called heliotropism. This maximises photosynthesis. Then once the plant matures and starts producing seeds, it locks into a fixed east-facing position, optimising warmth and attracting pollinators in the morning. Because energy is everything in the plant world, every decision, whether to grow, defend, bloom or survive drought is made under the pressure of limited resources. Building thorns takes energy, producing toxins takes energy, even emitting warning signals or forming these fungal partnerships costs something. So, although we're not really going to take plants vs zombies seriously, as plants aren't firing off peas or cabbages at zombies reanimated from the dead, but here's the thing, they do battle their own kind of zombies, day by day. Every day, plants face real biological invaders, fungi, bacteria, viruses, parasitic plants that try to take over their tissues, hijack their resources or reprogram their cells. When a pathogen slips through a plant's outer defences, the fight turns microscopic. Plants have surprisingly advanced immune systems, they can detect unfamiliar proteins, which is a sign that something's gone wrong, and respond fast. So some can self-destruct infected areas, triggering kind of localised cell death, known as a hypersensitive response. So it's sort of like cutting off a finger or a limb to stop an infection from spreading. Others ramp up chemical defences, strengthen cell walls or signal nearby tissues to prepare for attack. It does get weirder. In the insect world, zombie fungi like cordyceps takes over ants' brains, forcing them to climb and die in high places where the fungus can spread. These fungi don't just feed on the host, they control it, they rewrite behaviour. So although the zombies in Plants vs Zombies are silly, the idea of organisms hijacking others slowly, silently and parasitically is real. So could plants fight zombies? Realistically, no. But here's the thing, they don't need to. Because in the real world, plants are already fighting every single day. They defend themselves from insects, from viruses, from fungi, trying to turn them into their own personal resource factories. And they do it in ways which we're only just beginning to understand, with biochemistry, silent communication, and alliances that span entire ecosystems. So once you really see what plants are doing, how strategic and complex their survival systems are, it really does change the way you think about them. Plants aren't just green background, they're resilient, adaptive survivors, and honestly, that's even cooler than shooting peas at zombies. So if you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing. I do deep dives into the biology behind your favourite games, from survival strategies to speculative ecosystems. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.